Thanks for joining us today. We really hope that this ministry has impacted your life and blessed your heart. And if it has, we would love to hear your story. Send us an email. Tell us about you. Send an email to stories at edgewaterchurch.com. And also, if you'd like to partner financially with this ministry, you may do so at our website, edgewaterchurch.com. Or you can download the app through the iTunes Store or through Google Play. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for watching today. Hello, Edgewater. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dan Pryde. I'm one of the pastors here at Edgewater. Thank you for taking the time to uh, join us online. So glad that we get a chance to all be together. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at some ways coming up pretty soon that we can begin to gather in certain places, small groups first, and then eventually we'll be getting together with, with precautions, of course, here it's in, uh, in the worship center. But uh, uh, looking forward to just what God has in store. Even in these times we are apart, God has still been working. God has still been moving uh, in, in our worship times, in, in just in your personal devotion times. I've heard stories about how God is meeting you there and how you're continuing to reach out and, uh, and love and care for one another, kind of be in the hands and feet of Jesus for each other. So good job. Keep doing that. Um, as we've gone through this uh, quarantine time, you know, we've, we've had all kinds of different ways of, of passing the time. Some folks have gotten honeydew lists done. Uh, some have made good choices about health by getting exercise and eating right, even in these difficult circumstances. Others have kind of been curled up on the couch, scrolling through social media and Netflix. Uh, no judgment here. Um, but like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, if this had happened maybe 20 or 30 years ago, uh, things would have been different because you, you, you wouldn't be able to just run out to your local blockbuster and pick up the latest new release movie. Um, but now we have streaming services that pump entertainment into our TVs and our computers and, and our phones. The, the, new, the newest Star Wars movie dropped this week. So, so lots of different things that people have gotten involved in. I like watching movies, uh, but true confession time, I'm, I'm kind of a comic book nerd. Um, I, was, I was so excited many years ago when they started bringing comic books into the movies in, in a quality way. Uh, and, and honestly, these days, if someone's not wearing a cape or if someone's not flying or if stuff's not blowing up, I'm just, I'm just not going to watch it. Um, one of my all-time favorites has always been Spider-Man. I can remember having comics uh, when I was little uh, and, and reading about Spider-Man from comics to movies to cartoons. I like him in all those different places. Even, even the cheesy live action version on the show Electric Company back in the day. If you remember that, uh, you, you may remember kind of the, the cheesy costume, and, uh, but it was, it, was, it was something. It was, it was a live action kind of Spider-Man, so I enjoyed seeing it. I, I think one of the things that drew me to Spider-Man was the fact that he started out as kind of a skinny science geek. He, he was picked on. He was someone that you never would have expected to be a hero. He was the ultimate underdog. We tend to cheer for the underdog from, from Rocky Balboa to the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team to, to Rudy. Uh, we, we love underdogs. Yet in all human history, I think the greatest underdog story is of a of a Jewish rabbi born under some sketchy circumstances who gathered around him a ragtag group of adolescent apprentices and this miracle man so loved underdogs that he, that, he, that he healed the sick and the broken and he lifted up the downtrodden and he pushed back against bullies. This rabbi also challenged the political and religious authorities of his day to the point that they conspired together to kill him in the most brutal way known, death on a cross on a garbage heap outside of town. This underdog was no ordinary man, though, because three days later, after they buried him in a garden tomb, he rose from the dead, and he changed human history. 
though he never wrote a book or led an army or founded a city or built a building or the, the movement that he began spread from a few dozen to, to one third of this planet's population. This underdog's life splits history itself from B.C., before Christ, to, to A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. More books have been written about him than any other single person. More schools, hospitals, and orphanages have been established in his honor, too. The greatest underdog of all human history is, of course, Jesus. So today we're continuing on in part four of our series of kind of this, this big picture of, of the Bible, and we're going to talk about Jesus. This bird's eye view of this complicated book has kind of six movements that we've kind of broken it down into. We've looked at creation. Genesis 1 and 2 paint a portrait of a loving creator who speaks and brings about a complete creation for human beings to enjoy and care for and, and tend to. We've also looked at the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, it, it's not just the fall of Adam and Eve, but it's, it's our falling as well. We've taken God's gift of free will and we've rebelled against God. Last week, we looked at the third movement in the Bible and we looked at the history of God's people, Israel. Israel's cycle of destiny, disobedience, and deliverance it's, it's our journey too. And so today we kind of make our way past the, the 39 books of the Old Testament. We make our way into the 27 books of the New Testament. And we begin our New Testament journey with this amazing underdog, Jesus. Now, again, having read comic books since I was a kid, I've long been familiar with a guy named Stan Lee. Stan Lee helped create so many of the comic book characters that I grew up reading about. Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Ant-Man. If you've seen any of the uh, Marvel comic movies that have come around in the last 20 years, you know that one special piece of each of those movies is the place where Stan Lee makes a cameo in the movie. He, he, he's a mailman, or he, he's a guy on a train, or, or someone in a restaurant. He's the guy who created these characters, and he now shows up with them, in a movie, the, the creator becomes part of the creation. In that first week of this series, we talked about how God created, but now in Jesus, the creator becomes part of the creation. The one who created dirt <laughs> now walks on it. The one who was there for the first sunrise now gets to see it from a whole new perspective. He didn't come as some gigantic genie-like being to be feared and awed, he came as one of us. Jesus was and is God's ultimate solution for the sin problem of our planet. Jesus, the underdog, came to once and for all reestablish the relationship with God that we enjoyed in creation by starting a movement. But not, not just a movement, a revolution. A revolution not born from bloodshed, but instead a revolution of love. He turned things upside down. He defied expectations. He didn't do things the way that a lot of folks thought the Messiah should. So today we're going to take a look at Jesus and four distinct parts of his life. His birth, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. Now again, remember this is a, a big picture overview of all of this. We could preach years and years worth of sermons on Jesus and not even begin to cover every bit of it. Now, one of the, the tricky things about Jesus is that even though we were all created in the image of God, we've tried to create God in, in our image as well. So we have this tendency to kind of make Jesus into whatever we maybe want him or need him to be. If we need advice, he becomes Oprah Jesus. If we want or need something, he becomes Santa Jesus. If, if we get mad at someone, he becomes Terminator Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we don't always portray him for who he really is. John Ortberg wrote this in his book called Who Is This Man? He writes, how does Jesus survive his followers? The Inquisition and witch hunts and crusades and defense of slavery and imperialism and resistance to science and wars of religion come and go and return. 
Judgmentalism and intolerance and bigotry infect continents and centuries. Scandals of money and sex among church leaders never seem to cease. And Jesus' followers cause him far more trouble than his enemies. This is making Jesus in our image at its worst. In, to, to greater or lesser degrees, we all, we all do this in one way or another. But the Bible challenges us to allow Jesus to define and describe himself. This is one of the reasons why we need to be a student of the entire Bible and not just kind of the individual puzzle pieces that may suit our need or our perspective at the moment. Paul, the great missionary, wrote this about Jesus in Colossians 1.15. He writes, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, then look to Jesus himself. Jesus was God in the flesh. So let's, let's kind of start our little flyover of the life of Jesus. The four Gospels are the four biographies of Jesus that we find in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They paint a picture of, of, of a Jesus who came to start this kind of love revolution that challenges our sinful, selfish ways and replaces it with his own character. Jesus' revolution was a revolution of character that makes mean people nice, angry people peaceful, dishonest people honest. He came to turn enemies into friends. He came to tear down dividing walls of race, gender, economics, and education. Jesus radically invited outsiders to come in. And yet the Jewish crowds Jesus spent time with repeatedly wanted to to turn Jesus into this kind of revolutionary king who would overthrow the Romans with brute force. But Jesus was a different kind of king who started a different kind of revolution. So for today, we're going we're gonna to consider what it means for you and for me to, to join the Jesus revolution, that we're going to be following a different kind of king. We, we need the, the, the Jesus revolution to turn the hearts of people in the human family back to God and to one another. Ours is a world filled with division and hate. It'll take a Jesus revolution to transform the deep inner character of people to fix what ails our broken planet. Imagine a people who not only speak the words of Jesus, but live like Jesus. That's the kind of thing that'll change the world. That's a revolution. So in this story of Jesus looking at this uh, revolution and, and, and how it was kind of upside down from what you might think, there are four things about Jesus that we're going to consider today. So when we join the Jesus revolution, we're following a different kind of king, and we come to understand that Jesus' birth was scandalous. When you read the biblical narrative of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke's biography of Jesus' life, his birth and the circumstances surrounding it were full of scandal. Mary and Joseph weren't yet married, and yet she turns up pregnant. Normally, in that culture, people could have been put to death for that kind of disgrace. And yet, it's exactly into this kind of scandal of his birth that the Jesus revolution begins. Angels appeared to Mary and reassure her that her son would be a different kind of king leading a different kind of revolution. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33, where it says, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. In a nation with a history of kings, this announcement would have sounded pretty weird to Mary. Though, though Joseph was, was from the royal lineage of David, they were far removed from the royal uh, blood as, as a poor carpenter from tiny Bethlehem and a peasant girl from nowhere Nazareth. Kings are born in important places like Jerusalem. And then on top of that, the angel said that Mary's son's kingdom would never end. Mary knew some history and, and kings serve and then they're either killed or banished or they die. But the angel tells her that her son will be a king named Jesus who will rule forever. And, and it would all start with what you might 
consider an oxymoron. You, you know what an oxymoron is? Those two words that, that don't really go together like jumbo shrimp or deafening silence or bittersweet. Well, virgin birth is an oxymoron too. That Mary was a virgin who conceived and gave birth to a child without having a sexual relationship. It's two things that don't go together. But his scandalous birth declares that this is a different kind of a king who came to start a revolution and that he was indeed God in the flesh. 100% divine, 100% human. These are the origins of, of our king. This is the king we follow. Second, we find that in this Jesus revolution following a different kind of king, we find that Jesus' ministry was challenging. So except for a few days at the age of 12 when Jesus got lost from his parents during the Jewish Passover festival, we don't have much information about Jesus from his birth until he was about 30 years old. We, we know that Joseph and Mary raised him along with his siblings and that by age 30, his father Joseph had died. The Bible says that G Jesus grew up in a small village called Nazareth. It's a nowhere town of about 400 people. 12 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee. And then at 30, Jesus is baptized by his cousin John, tempted by the devil for 40 days and nights in the wilderness, and he emerges as a rabbi and preacher and healer. Most Bible scholars talk about Jesus' teaching and preaching and healing ministry, and, and, and I think you would agree that all of those areas were kind of challenging to the to the, both the religious and the irreligious people of the day. But what was Jesus' teaching ministry about? Jesus was a teacher, or a rabbi as he would have been called in that culture. Um, and this is why we see Jesus reading the, the Torah, the, their scriptures in the synagogue, and teaching with parables, kind of a common teaching method of, of Jewish rabbis in the first century. But what makes Jesus... The revolutionary, a different kind of king, was a radical different kind of teaching that he did. It was Jesus' challenging teaching ministry that set him apart from other rabbis and revolutionaries of his day. For example, rabbis taught their students to, to love their neighbors. This was necessary for Jews in a world that was filled with hate and animosity. Would have been a challenge. But let's read together the teaching of our rabbi and, and about who and how we are supposed to love in Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. Where it says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. This was unheard of back then, and we still don't do a great job of it today. Most people, yes, even in church, will, will not argue with being a good, loving neighbor but, but, but hating your enemies. But yet Jesus amps up how it is that we're supposed to love. Love your neighbors. Hey, check. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Wait a minute. Are you serious, Jesus? Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the original Greek says something else. Let me, let me, let me look that up. There's got to be a, a loophole for hating murderers and tyrants and Auburn football fans. And, but no, it's kind of a the radical teacher that Jesus was. Jesus taught other radical things about prayer and money and what it means to be first. And maybe more, most importantly, about who God loves. Jesus' radical teaching got him in hot water. This is the king we follow. Third, we find that in this Jesus revolution, following a different kind of king, we find that Jesus' death was offensive. Jesus' teaching and preaching and healing ministry ramped up and ultimately Jesus got in hot water with both the governmental and religious leaders of the day. The great crowds that came around to hear him preach made people nervous. A lot of folks, again, as we talked about earlier, had a different view of what they thought the Messiah was going to be and they wanted Jesus to overthrow the Roman government. And when he came into town, they called out Hosanna, a, a Hebrew phrase that means save us please. As he rode in on a donkey like a, like a king coming in from victory. 
And so all this, all this attention made the religious and governmental leaders of their day concerned. Would this miracle man from Nazareth actually lead a rebellion? As we talked about in our, in our last series that we did through Lent, where we looked at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, we saw then that in kind of a tag team effort, the Jewish leaders and the local Roman officials plotted together to have Jesus killed. The Jewish leaders were concerned that they were, they were losing their influence over the people as well as some of their money-making schemes. Remember that Jesus had the turn over the tables incident? And the Roman leaders didn't want anything going on in the place that they were ruling that was going to kind of rock the boat of, of the relative peace that was there in Israel. So after being betrayed by one of his own disciples, Judas... Jesus was taken to the high priest who sent him to Pilate. The Jewish leaders had limited power to punish Jesus. Only Pilate, as a Roman official, had the power and authority to have Jesus killed. After interrogating Jesus once and, and flogging him, which, which that in and of itself could have killed him because it was so brutal, Pilate hoped then that maybe the bloodthirsty crowd would be satisfied, but he was wrong. A second time then, Pilate cross-examined Jesus and he wanted to let Jesus go. But the Jewish leaders told Pilate, Pilate that Pilate was no friend of, of the Roman emperor if he released Jesus. They, they testified that Jesus claimed to be a king and all of a sudden they've kind of got Pilate backed into a corner. And then in John chapter 19, starting in verse 13, it says, when they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover, and Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. So Pilate calls Jesus their king, and no doubt he was kind of tongue-in-cheek when he said it, but this Roman official, whether he knew it or not, was speaking the truth. Jesus was the king of kings, but they couldn't recognize him. Well, sadly, the conspiracy between the Jewish and Roman leaders worked, and Jesus was crucified. Ironically, the, the sign was hung over Jesus' head that read, Jesus is of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Because this actually was who he was. On that Good Friday, if you could see the truth of the sign, Jesus' death was an offense. It's offensive because criminals die on crosses, not kings. But this is a different kind of king that we follow when we join this Jesus revolution. Jesus was a king who died an offensive criminal's death on a cross. He is no ordinary king. This is the king we follow. Finally, we find that in this Jesus revolution following a different kind of king, we find that Jesus' resurrection was restorative. We just celebrated Easter few weeks ago and, and, and we know the rest of the story and it, it's indeed the best of the story. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. In one of Paul's letters he describes the events this way in 1 Corinthians 15 starting in verse 3. It says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. The story of Jesus' resurrection is no myth. Verifiable eyewitnesses saw Jesus with their own eyes. They touched, embraced, talked, walked, and ate with the resurrected Jesus. Luke tells about a man named Cleopas and a friend who were some of the other followers of Jesus. And on Easter, they had kind of found themselves with their worlds rocked by all of the crazy events of the previous three days. And, and that evening, Jesus appears to them on a road to Emmaus, but they don't recognize him. Jesus calls them foolish because they should have known that, that all the, everything that happened to him was predicted in the scriptures. 
And then Jesus kind of took them through the long story short and explained how all of the Old Testament had pointed to all of this happening. The day was drawing to a close and the two walkers on the Emmaus Road, still not knowing that it was the resurrected Jesus with them, they, they asked him to, to stay and, and eat with them and spend the night with them. And it was only when they sat at the table together that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. Let's look at Luke 24, verses 32 through 34. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Hope was restored to these downcast disciples as they talked with the resurrected Jesus about the scriptures. This this resurrected, different kind of king restored their hope. And today, 2,000 years later, he can restore your hope as well. Your heart can be strangely warmed by by the presence of the resurrected Jesus. This is the king we follow. So his birth and ministry and death and resurrection, it makes Jesus a different kind of king who started a different kind of revolution. It wasn't a revolution of political power or religious zeal. It wasn't a revolution of of education or social or economic reform. It was a love revolution. Calling women and men back to this Garden of Eden-like relationship with God themselves with one another, with creation. Jesus was this underdog who came for underdogs like you and me. This is the king we follow. Please pray with me. God, thank you so much for this time today. I thank you for this king Jesus that we have the opportunity to to follow. I thank you that he, he didn't come as as so many other kings that we've seen in our history, in our world, where, where the, the kingship is a position of, of power and authority and dominion and, um, and, and where it's lorded over people and, and, and used to oppress people, but instead Jesus came and served and loved and taught and healed. And so God, I pray that you help us to pattern our lives after the example of this King Jesus. God, I pray that you help us to to join this revolution of of doing things differently, turning things upside down. Maybe you're here watching today and uh, you've never taken that step to start following Jesus. You've been on your own, you've been trying to make your way through life. But maybe now, even while you're sitting at home or wherever you may be watching this, maybe you feel that, that touch from God, that little prompting, that little nudge that says, you know, this is something I need to do. Well, I want to encourage you to do that. And one of the ways that we, that we start that journey of following King Jesus and joining this love revolution, we, we just commemorate it with a, with a simple prayer. And so I'm going to pray it out loud and I invite you to repeat it out loud with me, just phrase by phrase. And pray, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.